and she was always talking about him. So when we finally got together, I needed a place to hold a reception. Now, our church was big enough for 300 people, but the basement might have held 800 on a good day. We've been, been packed. So I decided I'm going to join Star because then I can use the, their uh, lodge for my reception. It's not a game, it's a red stick. Hey, Gallifam, it's Rachel. And Rhea. And we're the Gal sisters. We're actually Irish twins. Yeah, which means we're 15 months apart or less. So we have another Masonic interview with a couple of people who are very important to us. Yeah, they signed my petition. Um, they signed her petition. And he also signed Emma's petition to join Joby's. Their names are Kurt and Sherry Ann Johnson. They are the worthy matron and worthy patron of Lake Harriet, and they are also members of Unity Chapter up in Duluth. And they are our partners in crime. When there's no pandemic, we do go a lot of places with them, and we've had a lot of fun, and we're extremely thankful that they have included us in this Eastern Star and Masonic light. Kurt is also the Grand Chaplain in Minnesota, and his wife is his... Your escort or traveling companion. I can't remember which is which. We'll have to ask them. Yeah. So, that please enjoy this interview. Remember to be kind. This is a pro-Masonic channel, not a negative Masonic channel. Exactly. So, on that note, let's spill, spill the, the coffee. coffee. Okay. Well, Kurt Johnson. I'm Sherry Ann Davis Johnson. And we're familiar with the Gillis sisters because they are our fraternal sisters in the Order of the Eastern Star. And it's been fun, you know, really fun having them around, uh, getting to know a bit about their life, getting to know Rachel's daughter, Emma. Uh, and it's just, you know, we're just that kind of that extended family with, uh, as part of a fraternal organization. And this year, I'm Worthy Matron, and he is Worthy Patron. And I'm also the uh, Grand Chaplain, essentially the chaplain in this, for the state of Minnesota. Yep. We are both, uh, both third generation in Eastern Star, uh, fourth generation in Freemasonry within our families. And uh, just, uh, you know, enjoy it as a wonderful place to know great people and to do good work in the community. How long have you been in Eastern Star? I've been in, let's see, in another week, it'll be 34 years. And it'll have been, uh, it's now 26, so almost 27 years for me. So I think we've heard this story before, but it's a really good story. Can you tell us how you joined and why? That's I remember. <laughs> Eventually I wanted to join, but. With my dad being a minister, I sat next to his grandmother in choir, and she was always talking about him. So when we finally got together, I needed a place to hold a reception. Now, our church was big enough for 300 people, but the basement might have held 800 on a good day. We've been, been packed. So I decided I'm going to join STAR because then I can use the... <laughs> They're uh, lodged for my reception. So I joined Eastern Star then. And then uh, I uh, had one of my dad's parishioners made our wedding cake. And one of them videotaped our wedding ceremony. And my dad, my uncle, um, were there in front, and my aunt played the piano and sang. And 
And of the, what, what would you say, probably 200 people Something attending? Like that. Of the 200 people attending our wedding, I would say easily a quarter of them were involved in the Masonic organizations. It's uh, somewhere along the line. So, oh. Mm. Most of the in the church that her that my grandmother was at that her dad had had served for a while, uh, a large portion of the people in that church were members of Trinity Lodge and Trinity Eastern Star up in Duluth. So they were all excited for me to join, and then him eventually. <laughs> and one of the what one of the things that. A few years later, uh, she actually was part, she was uh, Ada, the first point of the star, when I was initiated. So she got to give me, give me that part of the story um, while trying to keep a straight face because I was making a, I was kind of smirking at her while I was standing there. Um, but then, you know, a couple years later, she asked me if I would be willing to go up the line with her in, in the uh, leadership roles. And I said, sure. And so, you know, so we did. So our first time as worthy matron, worthy patron was 1998. Yeah. Uh, my, my joining star was actually rather humorous because at, uh, what prior to that was because the lodge had our third degree meeting. So for your, for your viewers, here's a bit of trivia. If anybody ever wonders where the cliche Giving somebody the third degree comes from. It comes from masonry uh, because the third degree is the is considered the master mason degree. And so the, that happened to be on the first Monday of the month. In a month that it was the same week as the second Wednesday. And as you know, Lake Harriet meets on second Wednesdays. So I walked out of my first degree meeting. My, my third degree meeting as a newly uh, initiated master mason, and Brother Dale Seibert was there with petition, fully filled out in her handwriting <laughs> with her signature on it and his signature on it, just waiting for my signature. My petition was then read 48 hours later at the uh, Eastern Star meeting. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. <laughs> yeah. So, but yes, my grandmother was a member of Eastern Star up there in Duluth uh, for 49 and a half years. She died just before completing 50 years. She also while died she died two weeks before we initiate were initiated. Yep. So, or before we were installed. Installed as, installed as for the matron and patron. Yeah. And one of the last. So it was bigger sweep. And one of the things that. So, we were the associate matron and associate patron while my grandmother was still alive. And during the year that, uh, during that year, during that, one of the visits, we had just done a initiation of a new man. And so I sat there by her bedside and recited the associate patron lecture for her. And you could just see the tears in her eyes at the same time she was smiling from year to year, was so happy that mm -hmm. you know, we were continuing this piece of the family legacy. Uh, that And my mother it was... what. what had been a member for a couple of years. She was actually had joined uh, a couple of years before I was born and was a member until she passed away uh, when I was nine years old back in 1968. And the star, she had held the star point of um, of, of Electa back during her time. I got I actually I got the records of both my mother and my grandmother with. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Eastern Star from, from the secretary up at uh, Trinity, just so we have that part of the story. That's yeah. really cool. Every, everybody's life is a story. True. And we keep writing it. We keep writing it every day. Mm -hmm. And my oh, grandmother joined in 1921, which is when my mother was born. And five years, six years later, she was the worthy matron at St. Cloud, Granite Number no. Five. And to this day, when I'm in the East, I use her gavel that was used almost 100 years ago. So that's very, gavels have very interesting stories. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, so, actually, I have a picture of a gavel that uh, a couple years ago 
with uh, Roger Taylor and Peg Oliver in the in in the Grand East. The gavel that they were carrying with them was made from wood salvaged from the USS Arizona. Oh wow! Cool. This is Rias. It turned yeah. up. <laughs> Good. Good. My dad found it. Ah, oh, that's right. awesome. Well, one of these days you'll have to use it. Yep. I just think it's special that I still have mine. Yeah, oh, it is. It's very special. It is. And that'll be something that is with uh, you know with Emma being now involved in Job's daughters, and that that's something that will have some meaning meaning to carry on with her too. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, what other questions do you have for for us? Um. Well, how did you become a Mason? Um, you know, Justin lawfully constituted Lodge of Masons. <laughs> That is a, what the, the question you asked is exactly the question that is asked by the worshipful master during the opening ceremony. <laughs> she didn't and the, know. And the know. answer I just gave you was the answer, and this is not special secret stuff, what I just said, but it, it was the answer that the senior warden would give to the master on that question. So, <laughs> where, so I became a Mason. Uh, yeah, growing up, so as I mentioned earlier, is my my mother had passed away. My uncle was not real. He he wasn't anti Masonic. He just wasn't interested in becoming part of it because his feelings had been hurt. Because unfortunately, my grandmother from from the, what he tells me, my grandmother and grandfather were so involved that at times they made the mistake of putting the lodge and the chapter ahead of. Well, I had a family, especially, and since he he had been in Demolay for as a, as as a youth for a while, not all the way through. Um, but because of some of that, he just he just didn't want to be involved. He said, "I love what they do; they're you know great organization. I just don't want to be part of it. It's up to you what you want." Not ha having anything else to compare it to, I never joined Demolay. I was, you know didn't get involved in my younger days with it. But we went down to the Christmas party, to the Thanksgiving dinner, so we had supported the activities that went on there. So then, when, essentially, I joined when Sherry Ann asked, she said, you know, something that we can do together. I might want to go up to line offices someday. You could, you know, this way you'll be there, you'll be prepared, you'll know what's going on. Okay. Her dad was amazing. Um, and so when we did the third degree, a part of the third degree uh, involves an action that we re that when, when you hear so if you ever hear somebody referred to as being raised to the third degree or raised to the sublime uh, degree of a master mason or something like that. Her dad came down and he attended my third degree uh, ceremony. And so he was the one that, that reached down, took my hand and raised me. Uh, Gail Seibert was involved there as well at that time. Um, a couple other people that, a couple other people that you would have seen, have seen at the pancake breakfast uh, that have been chapter members but haven't attended for, for quite a quite a while would have been involved in that that as well. Um, but yeah, it's it's you know it's quite was it was quite the experience, and then. You know, after our year in the East in 98, 99, we, we kind of became paper members for a while while we were raising kids. At that time, 98, our kids were 9 to 0. Our youngest was born while we were in the East in 1998. Um, so you know, so it, our life got really busy after that as, as we started getting teenagers and stuff like that. And, and so we kind of dropped out for, you know, with, without ever dropping. We paid our dues. We maintained our membership. Uh, came back to cook the Dijon chicken for Brothers Night when, when requested. and Which was basically every year. For and quite a bit of it. Yeah. Children would help set the table and, yep. and stuff like that. We were involved as a family. We were, we're, so we were involved as a family. Um, but then uh, a few years ago, Aaron McKenna asked if I would go 
into the to go be her patron. And I, you know, at that point, we only had one more still in school. And I said, sure, I'd have time to do it. And I was looking forward to it and maybe actually being more active than we were before. Um, and that's, you know, that, so that's kind of was the reboot of our second round of being involved in Mason's and Houston Star. And I was asked, but I, I declined, but I ended up filling in pro temp for the, her year. So rather than being installed, I just kind of filled in, filled in. One, as one of the, one of the line officers. Yeah, we we just talked to a Mason from Alaska who was a courier. Okay. So he went he went over all of that with us. Yeah. Yeah. So anyhow, you know, so then uh yeah, and it's been fun. Then you know, this past year before everything got shut down due to the virus, I was traveling we were traveling around the state with the uh Minnesota Grant family and uh visiting chapters doing initiations. Um, we also visited the Grand Chapter session over in South Dakota. Uh, we, Sherry Ann is currently the Grand Representative of Ohio in Minnesota. And we think of the Grand Representative basically being a welcome wagon for the, for the fraternity. Uh, is that if some, the idea here is that if somebody from Ohio were to come to Minnesota and they maybe had some questions, they know that there is somebody here in Minnesota they could reach out to that would welcome them with open arms. That would give them whatever information they needed. If they wanted to attend a meeting, they would try to point them to an appropriate chapter to meet. Um, so back last June, I was able to, to schedule a business trip to the Cleveland area. Sherry Ann went with me, and we visited two chapters over there. Uh, the year before that, we I, she went with me on a business trip to Sacramento, California, and she went to a chapter with me out there. So between the two of us now, we have visited uh, three, four chapters in California, and one one out one in the area around Sacramento, three down in the Los Angeles area, and then we visited. Uh, let's see, one, two, three. Five in the Cleveland. She went to two, and I've gone to three since I've had more business trips over there. And it, you know, again, that part of the the cool part of the fraternity is you walk into a a meeting room anywhere, and once they realize that you're a member of Eastern Star or you're a member of the of a lodge, your family, and they're you're, they're smiling with you. You're sharing stories. They're as curious about what we do in Minnesota as what, you know, and, and they ask, well, what do you see that we do here that's different from what you do in Minnesota? And there's little nuances that every state does different. Because even though there is, for Eastern Star, there is the, the central general grand chapter, each state has nuances to their ritualistic work or to you know, just kind of how they do certain things. But it's all got the same basis. You know, it's all got that basis that goes back to when Rob Morris wrote the original ritual in 1850. Even though the ritual we use was rewritten by Robert McCoy in 1867. Um, the original ritual by Rob Morris was much more complex. Uh, and it just ended up being too much for people to, um, you know, to really put to put it on. So anyhow, so I, I became a Mason, and I really got off, off the top of the question there, didn't I? <laughs> um, but I, became, I, 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 so yeah, so I became a Mason in 1993, and the went through the routine of filling out the petition. A couple of guys in the lodge called me, chatted with me. Um, we. Did the, we do a series of three degrees, first degree, second degree, third degree. First degree is referred to as the entered apprentice. If you think about it in terms of a stone worker, that's the grunt. That's the guy that's given the job of carrying the rocks. The second degree is your fellow craft. That's the person that learned, supposedly has learned some of the, how to use the tools, 
but is given direction by the master mason of how to stir up the stone, how to level everything, how to how to actually do the work. The master mason, then the third degree, is akin to being the master builder. The original Masonic, the, the heritage of the Masonic Lodge goes back to the medieval lodges that traveled Europe, building Notre Dame, building the you know all these beautiful cathedrals over there and castles and stuff like that because they were the master builders. They were the 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 general contractors and the architects that knew how to make this stuff happen. Um, okay, so then my. So after going through those three degrees, in between them, I had some study work to do. I had to memorize parts of the ritual and be able to be able to go through a quiz and learn a handshake and learn the various what we call signs and tokens. Which people say, "Oh, well, those are those secrets, right?" Yeah, okay, fine. But you know, any college fraternity has secret handshakes and secret words and little sneaky things here and there <laughs> but you know because the college fraternities didn't never really got involved in community at that point and weren't in any positions of leadership nobody worried too much about it. you know there were there were periods that masonic lodges were actually people were fearful of what went on and we and of course you look at some of the conspiracy websites and there's people that are fearful of what goes on in lodges now it's like yeah okay yeah, yeah, that's the you know. We, so, hey, anyway, so that 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 was it. That was basically it. And then once I got through my Masonic first few Masonic degrees, I joined Eastern Star. Um, later on, I joined Scottish Rite. I've never really been active in, in Scottish Rite. That's where you would go from the fourth degree to the thirty second degree. And again, it's it's the same sort of thing. It's Lessons of morality and intelligence and and just you know, personal conduct uh, told through the use of allegory, you know, allegorical stories, whether it be stories that refer back to the Bible or refer to uh, you know mythology somewhere else, or you know, just a wide range of stuff. Knights Templar refers to some of that. You know, you know, Rhea, you're, you're involved with Evil Eight. You know, Knights Templar trait, or that Evil Eight traces their heritage to. Yes, Dr. I Evil. did know that. I learned that like 20 years ago, but I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. So, but yeah, you know, to uh, Jacques Evil Eight and the Knights Templar. And, you know, but again, it, it uses these stories of figures in history to tell, teach lessons about personal conduct, loyalty. Faith, yeah, you know, truthfulness, yeah, you know, all those virtues that separate a good person from not so good person. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> so, what would you say to someone who was like just learning about Masonic life and was interested in joining? Um. So first of all, I would ask, I would I would just ask them what it is it that interests them. Is it the community service? Is it the heritage? You know, what is it that what is the hook that's really got them interested? And once I know that, then I was like, okay, you know, great. Now here's some of the other things involved that might also give you interest because one of the things about about Freemasonry, unlike say a Kiwanis or other community organizations, is we have a history of over 300 years as a community organization. And you don't find that with many other organizations. Uh, so there's, a, there's, there's, there's this heritage that you, become, that you become part of, and it's a heritage organization that's bigger than any one, two, four, five of us. It's bigger than any one chapter or lodge. And yet, after each lodge has an opportunity to make a difference locally, uh, and you know, so what I would be doing is I would encourage that person also to think about what is their passion. What is it that they would really 
like to see done in their community. And if they can articulate that, they might be able to get somebody on board with them and, you know, and make something like that happen. You know, this past year, one of the things that we're passionate about is getting kids outdoors. So we were able to articulate and work with the chapter to provide a donation for a campership to the, the to Campus Quagama, a youth camp up in northern Minnesota. And between the the contributions this year and then last year when we went up there for a winter weekend with a few other Eastern Star people, between all that, we received enough for for three full week campership. Uh, which is wonderful because a lot of times kids don't get the, get that opportunity to get off of the blacktop and out, you know, out in the out out amongst the trees. So, um, but I, but yeah, I, I would, you know, I would tell tell a person I said congratulations. I'm glad you're you know, thinking of thinking of this that it interests you. Uh, I'd ask them if they had any questions. I would encourage them to, you know, to use it as an opportunity to really stretch themselves and take it not just as a thing to do, but take it as a challenge to really do something. Yeah. And one of the things that we always liked that you said, too, was that, you know, talk to individuals that already belong and hear their personal stories. Yep. I think I've heard you say that several times. <laughs> yes. That, that, <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> well, like like I mentioned earlier, I said that you know everybody everybody is writing their story. And everybody, you know, we all are formed by the people we meet, by the stories we intersect with, that we are part of the tapestry of life. And no place do you see that tapestry more evident than when you get involved in a fraternal organization. Um, you know, as part of my, as part, part of the installation as Grand Chaplain last year, they gave us a questionnaire that they used to create an introduction. They asked us, well, the question they asked was for a favorite quote. And I used a line from a author that I enjoy, Sherilyn Kenyon. And the quote that I used is one of the, is one that one of her characters. He says, "We're all part of three families: that which we are born into, that which we give birth to, and that which and that which we let into our hearts. Those that let into our hearts is the friends we make. Those that when we and again when you join a fraternal organization." You become part of that tapestry, and you can't help but not have those people coming becoming part of you, just like you too. Yeah, and and this is why Kurt that. always makes us cry. Yep, <laughs> <laughs> sort of a running joke at this point, especially Rhea. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, and I love to give you guys hugs, so you know. Yep, and then and we try to run away from Cherry Ann. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> she's jo she's teasing, I'm joking. She's teasing you. I, I, oh, oh, I know, <laughs> but you see, I got to make you feel good. Everybody needs so many hugs a day. Doesn't matter from whom, and I enjoy <laughs> giving, trying to give that to everybody. No, we love your <laughs> hugs, <laughs> <laughs> and we miss them. This I know. Been a very interesting time. Yes. So, so one of the interesting little comparisons is to com compare, put a quick little connection between Nathan's oh. and Eastern Star Initiative is that, as you recall, when we go through the Eastern Star Initiation, we refer to the star points according to some role that a lady plays in life. Ada is the daughter. Ruth is the widow. Esther is the mother, Martha is the sister, and Electa, Electa is the, Electa. No, the no, Electa is the mother. Um, no, okay, Esther is the wife. 
Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you got the daughter, the widow, the wife, the sister, and the mother. In Masons, we say that the purpose of a Mason is to provide for the welfare of the mother's wife, sister, daughters, and widows of other master Masons. Being that if if a if a Mason's family is in distress, it is the duty of other Masons to reach in and help. Years ago, uh, a friend of one of our Lake Harriet Masons had a severe accident from falling out of a tree. His job was working for a tree cutting service. The lodge did several fundraisers to help to help his family out. You know, that's what we're all about. Yeah. It's funny you you mentioned all that because Rainbow has so much has like a similar thing too where they talk about widows and orphans and all this other stuff. And I when they install the mother advisor, they say your job is to act for as to act as a mother for those who might not be so lucky. Yep. Well, again, you know, we've chatted about it, how it, the, the rainbow ritual sounds like it was written by somebody that was very familiar with Eastern Star. Oh, I'm sure he was. Uh, and, and, you know, and yeah, and they're all related. The, these, the appendant bodies were created to fulfill a niche for people that didn't fit in the other bodies. Rob Morris created Eastern Star to give the wives and daughters and sisters and nieces and female relatives of a master mason, the opportunity for that sort of a fraternal relationship with others. Uh, when Job's daughters and Rainbow and Demolay were created, again, it was for that similar reason, to impart the same sort of lessons about morality and virtue to the youth and in a manner, part of this is to, part of the reason for all these the organizations for the different parts of a family is to demystify the whole Masonic family so that people aren't afraid of what people do. You know, I remember back in the day, every two weeks, my grandmother would be all dressed up heading off someplace. <laughs> And then when springtime came around, it'd be about every two days she'd be dressed up going off someplace because she played the organ. During the spring installation season, she was the most popular person in the uh, in northern Minnesota. I believe, yes. <laughs> um, as a matter of fact, uh, there are there there are some of the uh, uh, recording in, information the proceeding the the written notes from from grand chapters from those years that would have her listed as playing the organ for a prelude or for a memorial service or for one thing or another uh she was she was never a grand organist huh. one is because she when i was told she had the opportunity but before she could be before she had to commit my mom passed away, and so my grandmother was kind of stuck helping to raise my brother. Um, so, so yeah, right now, right now we're sure both we we both have parents and grandparents that are watching our activity now in Eastern Star and just going like, "Yeah, we knew they'd be good at this." <laughs> <laughs> we have fun with it. Yeah, and it of course, is fun. Of course, in Eastern Star, when when we're in the east in, in the chapter. My 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 number my number one job is to tell a bad joke at the end, right? Yep. They're Always. real groaners. They can be real groaners. <laughs> they're dad jokes. Yeah. Say, yeah, they're like the dad jokes. Yep. Makes me miss every time you do that, it makes me miss the old state rainbow dads from Rainbow, the two guys that are not with us anymore, and it makes me miss George and Jean so much. Oh sure. I still miss them to this day. Yeah. Yep. They've been yep. gone 15 years, and I still miss them every single day. And well, for some yeah, reason, having those jokes makes me realize that maybe they're not so maybe they're not so far away. Well, mm -hmm. you know, and it's like like what I said 
year and a half ago now when we were when, when we were installed into the east yeah you know, at the end of the installation as part of our our closing prayer i challenged everybody that to not think of the prayer just being the people participating as just being those of us that were in the room that day i told i challenged people to look across at an empty seat imagine somebody that was a mentor to you whether it be in masons or Eastern Star, or Kleenex. <laughs> yeah, if this is going to get her, I know. Uh, picture that person there because they are with you. Every time you come to a meeting, every time you do an activity, everything you do that exemplifies the lessons that have become part of your life, you honor that person. You know, and I, I told that they are here right now with you mm -hmm. in this room. As we, as we complete this installation. And I know when we first were in, I could tell you his grandmother was there. She wouldn't have been able to come because of her health. But in some ways, her passing was a blessing because then she could be there with us. Oh. <laughs> so That's beautiful. Yeah, it, it really was. And you could feel her presence there, that she was right there and had the biggest smile <laughs> on her face that uh, one could ever see. Yeah. And the person we had playing the organ for our meetings that year knew my grandmother as a fellow organ player. My grandmother, he uh, it was uh, Jane Fassel's husband, Jim Fassel. And he sometimes had been in charge of the Grand Chapter Choir. And my grandmother would often be playing the organ for the choir for Grand Chapter. They knew each other. The person that played the organ for our installation in 1998, uh, Grace Klingman, formerly Grace Akers, she was the worthy grand matron here in Minnesota at the time that the chapel, the Eastern Star Chapel down here at the Masonic Home was built. But she also was a contemporary of my grandmother's. And so it was just, you know, it was, was cool, really cool, you know, meeting these people that knew my family, that, that knew my background. Some of them that knew me when I was a little runt showing up at a Thanksgiving or Christmas event with my grandmother, uh, which, of course, which is why I made things rather special last year on our visit up to Trinity is because that's where my grandparents and my mother were active. So it was kind of like, kind of like a really odd sort of homecoming. And that's what I appreciated in was Trinity. So. But, but yeah, you know, bottom line is if somebody, if, if somebody is looking for an organization to join, Masons, Eastern Star, any of this, it's it's really a place where a person can, you know, can do something. They can make some good happen, and they can. It they can't get frustrated. You know, well, yeah, they're going to get frustrated at times because sometimes, or any organization, whether it be ten people or a hundred people, can be hard to move, can be hard to turn. But, yeah. but it it does happen. And it sometimes it just needs a person with the idea to plant the seed and to ena enable everything to grow, to evolve. And, yeah, like I said, make something happen. So could you um, elaborate on Masonic fundraising and like pancake breakfast? Pancake breakfasts and stuff like that. Well, you know, people joke about Masonic conspiracies. We're just trying to get a corner on pancake breakfasts and rip dinners. All right, uh, because if you look right here in the Minneapolis St. Paul area, there's so many pancake breakfasts that go on done by lodges, and then you throw in the shrine and the shriners. And some of your viewer, you know, some some of your viewers may not know that to become a Shriner, a person has to first become a Mason. Um, and so, of course, the Shrine clubs do their pancake breakfast. 
and you know everybody does does things a little bit a little bit different. Uh, but the bottom line is most of those panels are used to support the work of the lodge. And is it? Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Doggies <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, so the, the pancake breakfasts are there to support the work that the lodge does. Uh, most lodges, a lot of lodges have scholarships. A lot of lodges uh, provide support to other organizations. Uh, some will support will provide support to shelters. Some will su provide support to uh, a specific need in their local law enforcement, like a canine need. Um, some will provide support to to uh, schools through a bikes for books program. Um, it's just you know, so many variations. <coughs> but you know, at Lake Harriet, our pancake breakfast is the biggest fundraiser we have, and we get you know we end up with between twenty and thirty people helping out in one place or another, maybe more. I don't know the exact count. But that turns into a contributions twice a year uh, to local organizations of you know six, seven, eight thousand dollars food shelf. Yeah, you know, total. Uh, they go. Sometimes it might go to a food shelf. Uh, it's, you know, some of the typical ones are the Joyce Food Shelf in South Minneapolis. I know uh, on purpose. The, <laughs> huh? I grew up not very far from there. So. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, and then another another one, is, the regular one, is the Lake Harriet Community School. The PTA comes in and they they bring people in, and ex and we work with them on you know on a daily basis with, with to to uh, their needs to help support things for the teachers or to do uh, field trip scholarships for students. Uh, we help out with with uh, insulin needs for the Edina schools, if, you know, for the some of the diabetes supplies they have for students. That you know, and that uh, we, we've helped out at the we make donations to the uh, St. Joseph's Home for Children. Huh. Um, there is oh, what else? There's the uh, Right Care Clinic. That's sponsored by Scottish Right that gets supported by, by Minnesota Masonic Charities. But we also provide some lodge based support to the charity. Uh, we've helped out with Boy Scouts. It's just, you know, each year the master of the lodge gets input into where they would like to see some of those donations go. So, you know, you, you get an opportunity. So, whoever is the master, similar to whoever is the matron and patron of the chapter. They have some input into what where they would like to see some help, and some assistance go. That's a great time. Mm -hmm. You know, lodges us the pancakes. We do the we do the bake sale. We get to help. Uh, you know, sir, yeah, we well we get to help out there serving up serving in the morning. You know, great Rachel, you're like you know you're like a mad woman out there on the floor. Well, <laughs> I, it was my job. <laughs> huh? That was my job. career yeah. for a while. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and Rhea just has a blast there with the, uh, you know, at the bake sale, just, you know, talking to people and helping sell, sell stuff. And, you know, and it's fun seeing the smiles on people's faces. And Emma helped with the bake sale. And it, yeah, and so Emma much helped fun with that. It. Oh, it yeah. Let her do it because she enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And that's fine. You know, and a few years ago, we, you know, we added you know, it was our idea to add in the idea of having some coloring pages and crayons out on the table for families. So and I, a lot of times the family shows up with the kids. I'll uh, go, go over there and, and say, well, you know, don't forget, you got some sheets here to color. And I'll tell the kids now, just so you know, coloring pages and the crayons are to keep the parents busy so they don't have, so they don't get in the way of you having some, some more pancakes. I usually get, get some pancakes. <laughs> Try <laughs> little smiles out of the kids and, and, and snickers from the parents. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. In fact, they are coloring. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, but yeah, no, it's that's a great time, and 
you know, hopefully we'll get through everything and we can start doing the uh, Ludafist dinner again. That's the that's the biggest fundraiser for the chapter. Um, and you know, again, it goes to good good stuff here in Minnesota. The actually nationally, the the primary charity for Eastern Star is service dogs and supporting the training and placement of service dogs for first responders and veterans with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, the, there's, there's other charities. There's, if somebody were to go to the Grand Chapter website or the Minnesota Masons website, and you'd see all kinds of information out there about scholarship. You don't have to be a Mason. You don't have to be in a Masonic family to apply for any of those scholarships. Um, but yeah. a lot of people don't know that because that's not right. out there for them to understand that oh well I don't really can't really afford to go any place but if they were to apply for a scholarship that would help them go someplace mm -hmm. and for, for members and for for uh, the, the, the one thing we have in Eastern Star uh, in Minnesota that only for members and members families is there is an interest-free educational loan program? I didn't know. Or, go to the go to the Grand Chapter website. <laughs> there, there there is a educational loan program, and we have, and that's going to be one of those things we're going to want to make sure that, that as we roll out a new website that we uh, get the word out about that about that. But yeah, that that's one part that's only for members and families. But the other scholars. Uh, you have the Estaro Scholarship for people that are in training for any sort of a religious leadership type of role. Uh, that could be as a pastor. It could be as a Christian educator. It could be a music, somebody involved in music ministry or camping ministry. Just any sort of religious leadership. It's not just for the preacher. There our, is Our preacher happened to have gotten one of those yeah. Estaro Scholarship. And he's not a Mason or anything, but um, one of the star members knew him yep. and had him apply. So that's a little a cute story. But and then there's the and then again in Minnesota we have the Rusham Scholarship, which is for high school seniors. And then we have the Pat Rasmussen Scholarship, and that is for continuing education. So even if a person has a couple years of scholarship. A lot of times, once you have a couple years of college in, you may have a hard time finding other scholarships. In Minnesota, we have a scholarship for people in a continuing education mode. And it doesn't have to be college. It can be vocational. Uh, but so, yeah, what happened with our pastor is one day he was telling a, he was giving a sermon on perseverance. And he was talking about how, you know, sometimes you need somebody else's perseverance to get you through something. He was telling a story about a lady in his town that just kept pestering him about a scholarship application. Oh, you haven't done yet? You haven't done yet? And he said, you know, I finally turned it in so she would quit bugging me. I received a scholarship from it. From. And it helped me get through my, my, my uh, pastoral training. Afterwards, on the way out the door, I said, by the way, Pastor Rose, is that in a scholarship? How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I put two and two together. <laughs> nice. And we also happen to know who that person was that pushed it. So, well, we no, we did not. We never knew the person. But yeah, yeah. It, no, it was a was it? It, no. It was somebody from Unity chapter. Oh. So when I when I so when I when I put the put the note up, and I sent a note off to Kathy Foster about it. She says, oh, that had to have been you know, so-and-so. And well, yeah, he, he mentioned the name of who it was, and when I told Kathy Foster, she said, oh, yeah, you know, she passed away several years ago, but yeah, I could see her being very persistent about that one. So that was kind of fun. We got a picture with him afterwards that I shared about, you know, it, that I shared on Facebook about the, uh, you know, here was an actual recipient of one of the scholarships. Um, Kathy Foster shared it on her Facebook page as well, and on the uh, her Unity chapter down in Austin. So, yeah, it was just you know another cute little story. 
from it, it, inside the big wide world of Eastern Star and Freemasonry. <laughs> It's a wide world, but people all know each other. It's not a super large world. No. 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 And, it, and Facebook makes it a lot smaller. So we dropped in. You know, it's, it's been one of the fun things about, you know, even though this pandemic stuff and the lockdowns have not been fun, have, have been definitely a struggle for so many, it's also forced people into doing some things that they wouldn't have done otherwise that created opportunity. So, for yeah. instance, in one of the chapters that that the chapter we visited outside of Sacramento, uh, I connected to their Facebook page. They said they're when they said they're going to do a just a Zoom social one evening. We jumped we jumped in on it w- with them. Said hi. <laughs> uh, nice. Done. We've done that a couple times. We did a Zoom social in Minnesota, and somebody invited somebody. I think that joined that hooked in from from Manitoba. Um, you know, we've done Trinity, yeah. Right? You know, the chapter that we've got dual now, we joined in with them at a we meeting, said, yeah. We joined so in one of their Zoom meetings, which was fun, yeah. So, so her brother, her brother has attended, uh, has visited a lodge down in the Dominican Republic and in Puerto Rico. Uh, some of our lodge members in Minnesota, at Lake Harriet have attended a lodge over in uh, over in Geneva, Switzerland. Oh wow! Cool. Yeah. We actually had one of our Minnesota lodge members had to move to Switzerland for business, so he joined the lodge over there. So they joined. So they went to visit him and visited his lodge. Oh, awesome. And uh, and I several years ago on a business trip out to Washington D.C., Alexandria, Virginia. I attended a lodge at uh, a lodge that met in a lodge room in the George Washington Masonic Museum. Oh, which you'd have cool. to look, look that up. It's a cool building right up on top of the hill in Alexandria. And I got lost over there running like many, many years ago, and I couldn't <laughs> find my way back. And I started crying back when I was oh, still okay. married. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, this is over in Alexandria, not in DC, but in Alexandria, way up yep. on top of the hill. Yep. I know exactly where that is. Yep. I got lost over there when I was doing quiz bowl stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> like guys from Alaska we talked to was a Mason over in Belgium. Oh sure. For a while. Yep. And he he said he didn't know they weren't speaking English, but he knew what they were saying because yep. Yep. the ritual was the same. Yep, it's gonna be very similar. Um, and you know, and even back back during the wars, there were military lodges. There were lodges that would pop up within a military unit. That then, you know, those lodges disbanded afterwards. But so that they could actually enjoy a little bit of peaceful time in a lodge meeting, even when they were you know in combat. Oh, cool! Yeah, Scott Anderson told us that. I think he did. Yep. But this guy, he he was he's a vet, and he served in Afghanistan. Yeah, we've talked to some very interesting yes, random yeah. masons, and we're like, <laughs> wait, what? Well, you know, masonry, you know, masonry used to be the movers and shakers of the community, and some of that has been copied. You know, the the involvement in the community has been copied and used as a model by other organizations, but without the ritualistic, without, you know, without the heritage, without the stories behind it, it's just, you know, it's the doing. And, you know, there's, you know, there's just something about those stories. There's something about that heritage that makes it a richer experience. You know, anytime you're out there able to do something for somebody and get, get hands on and help somebody, it's great. But when you realize that you're doing that as part of a 300-year heritage of service, just you know, it makes it something special. Uh, I get people occasionally that will say, "Well, it sounds religion." I said, "No, it's not a religion. We're not worshiping any. We're not praying to some special Masonic god or anything like that." <laughs> what people do find that if they have a spiritual life. That masonry and Eastern Star can enhance it. 
kind of like putting it to an amplifier and give you another view, another color to it that just makes the whole thing a richer experience. Yeah. So, and I know people in Eastern Star that are Christian, in, that are Jewish, that are more Wiccan. Uh, they're just, you know, they're all over the map. And they, you know, but they accept that even though the, the stories that we operate off Eastern Star are stories out of the Judeo-Christian Bible, that the stories are there as allegorical illustrations of a point. It's not the story that somebody has, you know, that, that you know, controls somebody's destiny or, you know, the, even though it's coming from the Bible, it does, it, it's not their religion, but the virtue, the moral, the act, the point of the story applies to anybody. Yeah, I think the nice thing about Freemasonry and Eastern Star is that it's free. Yep. That, yep. you know, you have the choice to be here and to be yourself. <laughs> and yep, your beliefs yep. are your own. <laughs> yep. Well, and now, did the Masons that you talked to, did they actually explain where the term Freemason, Freemasonry came from? I don't think Charles might have, have but I can't okay. the, well, the The old Masonic guilds, the labor unions of Europe. You had you you had people that were Masons, and some of them were under the employ of a particular king, particular landowner. They weren't free; they were employed and under the pay of a single person or a single structure. The Freemasons were your roving lodges of Masons. That they would work on this project. When they were done with that project, they were free to go and work for whomever else was willing to pay them. That's that was the Freemasons. They weren't indebted to one person, one political structure. Uh, the so that's where the ancient Freemasons. You know, in in with the lodge, we have the initials A F and A M. Ancient, free, and accepted Masons. The ancient Freemasons. Were those roving guilds of masons? The accepted masons were the non masons that came and liked the allegorical stories that came about from using the tools of mason to illustrate life's lesson. Yeah, the 24 inch ruler. We, you know, we, we will say an operative mason would use it to measure and lay out their work. But we, as free and accepted masons, use it to govern the hours of the day, splitting it, and I may not get this exact, eight hours for our usual avocation, eight hours for service to our family and community, eight hours for rest of the vacation. All the different tools that a mason used would have a allegorical attachment to it that would be used in a accepted Masonic lodge, where what we're building is not the castle, but ourselves. So the 24-inch ruler gives us some perspective on how we use our time. The, you know, the uh, trawl gives us some perspective that, yeah, we got rough edges and we used a trawl to use some mortar to assemble and smooth and stuff like that. The chisel is to, you know, square up our stone property. Uh, the, the square, the carpenter's square, for instance, masons would use a square as well to square right things. We use it to make sure that we walk up right now, so all these have stories related to it. Um, and, you know, that's where the accepted Masons come from. The Freemasons are that they were free to travel from job to job. The accepted are those that Masons, but they got involved because they 
were attracted by the allegory, by the story, by the lesson, by being part of something bigger than itself. And back in the day, people didn't travel as far out of their community. So many of these lodges, especially here in the States, you know, lodges tend to be very neighborhood. Now, you know, we've got people that will travel 45 minutes to get to a meeting or more. Yeah, you know, that didn't used to be the case. But now people also have so many other things going on in their life that that there's so many so many more things pulling on our time one way or the other. That that really is what started causing a big drop in in masonry and Eastern Star is that people are just running out of time and places to be involved. The other thing that affected it is that the Previous generations took the its secret a lot more serious than the current generation. And so there are people that will say, I never knew my grandfather was well, amazing. He never told them. Hmm. Uh, they all, it was also a thing, that, you know, the uh, cliche to be one, ask one. Well, to ask one, you sometimes have to know where one is. <laughs> that would be, you know, that was sometimes difficult. Well, and which then fueled some of the concerns about secret people being secret. So, the same was true in the book. Yeah, just trying to think. I've lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Yeah, we heard we heard a rumor that they're still very much like that in the UK. That they're not as open. <laughs> um. There's think, even places in our country, certain states, that are very secretive about that and stuff. Um, or at least they, so for instance, one of the things we heard was, unless it's changed, I don't know, but in Florida, the Eastern Star Chapter could not advertise a fundraising. They could put signs up, but they couldn't, but they weren't allowed to. You know, really do much, do much advertising, do much in the way of PR, um, or even asking members or people finding yeah. out people to join. Yeah, so um, I'm not surprised that in the UK if they're still a little bit more clo close to the vest. I don't know if the UK is having quite the same kind of membership problems that we're having here. You know, the Minnesota State Capitol was built the early 1860s, and you would think that a state capital would be a prime location for somebody to do a Masonic cornerstone ceremony. Minnesota State Capitol never had one because it was at a time that masonry was looked down upon. And that's gone, gone back and forth over the years. There, you know, there, there were periods during, during the uh, last during the 200 years of the United States <laughs> that uh, Freemasonry was looked at with skeptics. Um, and, you know, but back in the old days, you know, the uh, the conspiracy theory websites back in the old days, that was the uh, corner table at the local bar. I believe that. <laughs> yeah, you know, the guys would get together and they would say, have you ever wondered why our City government has so many masons and leadership positions, and it's all masons on the city council. Well, you know, maybe because they're the ones that are trying to make a difference. But and our our it, country it, was founded by Freemasons, yeah, for the, for the most. Anyone, part. Yeah, yep. Yeah, there, you know, there's there's uh, the most people put out numbers about the Declaration of Independence that were are more than what were actually confirmed. I believe the was it forty two signers. I think there was like something in the upper teens that have been confirmed that were actually masons. Uh, you know, Paul Revere was a master of his lodge. But that's why there was that's why there's a lodge or there is a lodge called Paul Revere Lodge in Minnesota. Yep. yep. I bet that, I always thought, I always just assumed it was because he was a mason. Yep. You know, he was he was a master he was a master of his lodge. Um. The lodge that I had visited in Alexandria, Virginia, is the lodge that actually George Washington himself was once the master of. 
Yeah. He's a pet. I know he's a past yeah. master. We yep. talked about that. Yeah, and uh, they actually have one of their one of their tasks where a lot of their funds go to is curating and restoring Washington's Masonic collection of stuff. Um, that's a, if you ever if you ever get to Alexandria, Virginia, that's a very interesting museum. <laughs> I'll have to go to the actual museum yeah, and not just you know run around that. and get lost and start crying. <laughs> it's, you can they do they have a virtual tour online. You can go online and check yeah. it out, and it's it's pretty cool. Cool. I'm when I was in Alexandria. It's been a long time. Yeah. <laughs> so, anything else? One last thing. Can you give an example of? One of your Kurt jokes? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Let's see here. Okay, so, so here's one from uh, last Thanksgiving. Why did the turkey cross the road? Okay. It was Thanksgiving Day, and he wanted people to think he was a chicken. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> um, oh, what was that one? Uh... <laughs> Um, oh, why did Cinderella never get selected for the baseball team? Why? Because she always ran away from the ball. <laughs> that was an old George and Jean one. It was. Yeah. yeah. God, I miss George and Jean. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, it's not nothing to be sorry about. They would they would steal our they would steal our stuff and they would drive away with it. <laughs> and so we used to kidnap their hats and make them pay for the grand service project to get them back. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that was so long ago, but I remember every I remember like it was yesterday. So here so here's one here's a Masonic funny story. One night a brother was heading home after indulging a bit too much at the board after his lodge meeting. He is weaving a little across the path, steadying himself against the lamppost. A concerned policeman saw him and walked over. Well, sir, where are we going at this time of night, eh? Brother replied, I, officer, am going to a lecture on masonry. Amused, the policeman asked him, just where are you going to hear a lecture on masonry at this time of night? The brother replied, from my wife. <laughs> Uh, he was walking through the uh, recreation ground of his local park when he noticed a huge fight going on in full fury on the football field he is passing. What's going on? He asked the spectator watching from the sidelines. The other side replies, eh, it's a football game between the Masons and the Knights of Columbus. <laughs> What's the score? Asked the first man. I don't know. It's a secret. Oh, but... <laughs> oh it's a secret. <laughs> That's funny. How many Freemasons does it take to change the light bulb? How many? Uh, let's see. It's a secret. <laughs> love it. <laughs> <laughs> I love the bad jokes. Me too. I love bad jokes. Your ex was really good at that. Yes, he jokes. was very good at that. And he could like stay... Well, should he say that on Wednesday night? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, to subscribe to the Gala Sisters YouTube channel, go to the, their page, hit like, ring the little bell, and you'll get notified when they have interesting things with uh, crazy old people like us on here. <laughs> well, what can we say? Perfect. Everybody <laughs> says it all differently, so we'll make it funny. Did you see, or we had an Aussie girl who had her stuffed animal say it. Yeah. So. Uh, the dog's asleep. <laughs> he Emma was, was snoring was... to the conversation. <laughs> Emma was listening intently and then just walked off and fell asleep. <laughs> yeah, we should probably go, grab some probably go wake her up. Yeah. It's a little early for her. Well, as always, thank you for coming on this segment of Spilled Coffee. Yep. That's what this is called. It's called Spilled the Coffee. And 
If this you, should go out next month. If you have any desire to come back, just let us know. <laughs> well, yeah. nothing else. If you're still doing this in a few years, yeah, you know, our my Eastern Star, our Eastern Star career will be continuing. There might be some new stories down the road. True. So you never know. You'll have All to right. stay tuned. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yep. We'll see ya. Bye. 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 Have a good evening. You too. Yep. It's not a game. It's a red stick.